Thank you, Councillors. To the Mayor of the City of Clarence, Councillor Brendan Wallman. I acknowledge the Tasmanian Aboriginal people as the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet. I pay respect to what was past and present and recognise their continuing spiritual connection to the land. Before we commence with tonight's meeting, please let us all pause for a quiet moment of reflection and respect before we commence with the council meeting. Thank you, councillors. Please be seated. Well, good evening, um, everyone, and welcome to the Cloud City Council meeting of Monday, the 27th of February, 2023. This meeting is being broadcast live on YouTube, and what is said in this meeting is not protected by privilege, and there is a link to the agenda papers on the council's website. Moving on to item number two, there, I note there's a full house tonight, so there's no apologies. Uh, item number three, declarations of interests of councillors or close associates. Are there any declarations from councillors? There being none, we now head into our omnibus items. The first one being um, 4.1, confirmation of the minutes uh, of the council meeting held on the 6th of February 2023. They've been circulated. Are there any issues arising? There being none, we move now on to item 4.2, Mayor's communications. And uh, my diary entries from the 7th of February, the 27th of February, 2023, uh, have been circulated. I also note uh, Councillor Mulder and Councillor Warren uh, attended events on my behalf as well. Thank you, Councillor Goyne. We'll, we'll add that to the list. Thank you very much. Um, yes, Councillor Mulder. Oh, sorry. sorry. Excuse me. Sorry, Councillor Mulder. Councillor James, I didn't see you there. I'm sorry. Okay, thank you, Mr Mayor. Uh, I refer to your diary entry on the 11th of February 2023. Yes. Uh, the Minister's meeting, the Warrain Defence Force land discussion. Uh, I believe that's the old B Company or the building on the corner of Quarry and uh, Cambridge Road. That's correct, Councillor. There has been some discussions in relation to whether the State Government will take ownership of that and there may be a deal that may be entered into uh, in relation to Clarence being involved <coughs> uh, as part of the uh, homelessness in the city. You're 100% right, Councillor James, and can I say that uh, that yep. was a meeting uh, with um, the Assistant Minister for, for Defence, uh, uh, Matt Thistle, the Honourable Matt Thistlewaite, MP, Councillor Hume, uh, Mr Pask and myself that occurred on that Saturday morning, the 11th of February. Um, we uh, expressed um, the Council's position, and as you correctly point out, there are three tiers of government involved uh, in, any, uh, in the consideration of that site. Uh, from our perspective, um, as councillors would be aware, um, crisis accommodation is something that we are very keen to see occur. Um, uh, Minister Thistlewhite understands our position. He was also to receive a briefing um, uh, from the State uh, Minister, uh, Minister Barnett, uh, on this issue. And in recent times too, as you'll note from my diary entries, I met with um, uh, our local uh, federal member for Franklin, the Honourable Julie Collins MP, who also has cabinet, federal cabinet responsibility for housing, and, and we also discussed it as well. There's not much more I can re report at this stage, except to say that um, uh, both the federal and state governments are very uh, aware, very well aware of Council's position in our keenness to see uh, crisis uh, accommodation for the homeless in our community um, be delivered. Thanks. Councillor Mulder. Um, just a point of correction. Um, on the 15th of February, the, uh, your, your um, communication refers to the fact that I attended on your behalf at uh, Cupper with a Cop at Shoreline. I actually believe the Deputy Mayor was present at that particular function and it'd be much more appropriate if the Deputy Mayor represented you at such a function uh, than I. Well, thank you, Councillor. As you know, I was, uh, I was away representing the city uh, elsewhere, as you'll note from my diary entry. So, Deputy Mayor, were you at the... Um, yes, I did attend uh, the function, Wonderful. and it was a great function. I'm quite happy for both of us to be listed as attending. Uh, that's <laughs> 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 the question, the question is, 
who attended. The question was who's represented. All right, thank you, Councillor Mulder. Are there any other uh, issues to... <coughs> Councillor Darker. Um, with regards to your meeting with Senator Claire Chandler on the 20th of February, can I inquire as to the topics of that meeting and whether that yeah, has anything certainly. to do with the Monday night Hobart City Council meeting or trans issues in general? No, I can honestly say that, uh, as I would honestly say, <laughs> uh, there were no items along those topic lines discussed. Um, in essence, uh, the Senator uh, wanted an update as to major projects in the City of Clarence and Skylands was front and centre. Uh, from that meeting, um, Senator Chandler, I understand, was reaching out to the Carr family to get a briefing uh, from them as to what's proposed to Druthie Point. So, um, no, there were no other uh, issues apart from that discussed. Housing was discussed and also um, our federal budget submission. Uh, which is something I touched on very briefly with um, with her, because um, she's now in opposition, but uh, provided Senator Chandler with an overview in general terms of projects that this council supports and looking for uh, assistance from the federal government. Thank you, Councillor Darko. Councillor Warren. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm particularly interested in the um, items that affect Clarence. So, for instance, I'm, I'm probably less interested in the 50 years Rest Point Casino anniversary except to ask, was that well attended by other mayors from the local um, Greater Hobart I, I, there, were, there was a very strong local government contingent there. Okay. Um, and I was also going to ask about the topics of the Claire Chandler meeting, Senator Chandler meeting. Um, the meeting with Chris Hazel Spectrum Group um, to do with road network bypasses. Am I correct in thinking that's a construction company? That, that's correct. So, yes. what was what? May I ask what that meeting was about? You may ask. Yes, you may take your seat. I'll, I'll answer the question. Thank you. Uh, so, Mr. Um, uh, Mr. Hazel had been has been in contact with council, my predecessor, for some time. He has a number of solutions, traffic uh, related solutions. He asked to come and uh, meet and greet with me uh, to bring me up to speed with what he'd previously briefed my predecessor on. Uh, I still have the plans in my office. If you'd like to have a look, you're more than welcome to have a look at those. Um, but with most of these types of meetings, um, uh, as we've discussed before, Councillor Warren, um, I can't unilaterally make any decisions or give any assurances. So that certainly didn't happen. Uh, it was an opportunity for Mr Hazel to bring me up to speed with, um, with his view of the world and potential solutions for traffic. Did you have another question? Thank you. Yes, I did. And I presume he's also discussing that with the, um, the state government. Oh, he, he has for some time. Would, Absolutely. would be yeah. a, a state interest. Um, could you also give me um, details of the Spencer's Cafe meeting and the CERDA meeting? And for my ignorance, explain to me what SERDA stands, S -E -R -D -A stands for. Yes, please. certainly. Well, well, the Spencer's Cafe meeting was with, with staff. Uh, Carly Martin and her husband, um, Chris, uh, had, some, had some issues with regards to uh, alfresco dining. Uh, and particularly related to the East Derwent Highway. Um, so two staff members and myself attended that meeting at their request and we're working through those particular issues now. CERDA is the South East Region Development Association of which uh, this council is a member along with uh, Sorrell, Tasman and Glamorgan Spring Bay. It's an economic development association between uh, these four councils. It's something that we've been a member of since day one. Uh, my uh, predecessor as mayor, was um, Vice President, and I'm pleased to announce that I was at that meeting elected Vice President as well. So thank you for your question. Just one more little thing, and this is just a general request perhaps of the officers, that whenever we have an acronym, that we have the name spelled out in full and the acronym in brackets for the benefit of those people reading um, our minutes. Good. Thank you, Council uh, Warren. Are there any other um, questions on Mayor's Communications? There being none, we move now on to 4.2.1, a um, study tool report. And um, I table an interim a report of the recent study tool to Perth. And in the interest of transparency and the benefit of the public, I will read the report. Uh, the application for the Skylands development south of Tramie and Rokeby is arguably the most important greenfield development in Australia at this time. The construction of Druthy Point would complete the development of the Hobart Amphitheatre from Taruna, Mount Nelson through Hobart, across the Tasman Bridge and south through Bell Reeve and Howrah, concluding at Druthy Point. It is imperative that councillors make the critical, this critical decision from a fully informed pers perspective. Five councillors, including me as Mayor, chose to take the opportunity 
to be part of a site visit to Jindee in Western Australia, which is the closest development both geographically and in topology. The trip followed from earlier visits to Jindee by two other councillors. The Jindee development uses an innovative and modern philosophy that has a people and community focus. They are creating neighbourhoods where there is a, the potential for all daily needs to be met within a 15 minute walk, and there is a focus on the form of buildings, considering the smallest of details. The buildings at Jindee take the elements of Western Australian heritage buildings and create a modern interpretation with the use of sandstone, large front, large front balconies and tin roofs. The tour was very full. It began with a presentation about Jindee from Hatch Roberts Day, the Australian-based consultants who worked on Jindee, and the other developments we visited. The presentation covered the origins of Jindee, the planning controls and architectural qualities. We visited Hillary's Marina, Harbour Rise, Eden Beach, Jindee, East Perth, Henley Brook, Woodlake Park, Allenbrook and Subiaco. Each of these visits made clear the impressive work undertaken in WA on urban renewal and new communities. At Jindee, it was a pleasure to meet the Mayor, CEO and Director of Planning and Sustainability of the City of Wanneroo, and to understand their Jindee experience from a council perspective. Linda Aiken, the Mayor of Wanneroo, was incredibly proud of the Jindee development and the way council were able to support this innovative project. Wanneroo was very, were very positive about working with the developer, utilising contemporary approach to create a new community, and felt it particularly important to form strong relationships with all levels of government and the local community. The land developer was there to explain the 30-year journey the project has taken. Her passion was infectious as she walked us around the development, explaining the thinking behind each of the elements. While there is a substantial component of the development to be completed, it was clear her high standards would not be compromised. As we walked around the estate, it was great to be able to chat with new residents of the estate who were enjoying their surrounds and being part of their new community. They enjoyed the interaction their front veranda promoted, the relaxed feel to the area with fewer cars on their street frontage and the access to the beach. Colleagues, a further more detailed report will follow this summary. However, I consider the trip a success and well worthwhile, assisting me and my fellow councillors to make one of the most important decisions for the future of Clarence. And I'll table that report. I also would like to uh, note that a full report of the study tour will be provided at the Special Council meeting next Monday, the 6th of March. Councillor James. Oh, yes, thanks, Mr Mayor. Um, that interim report, has that been co-signed by the other members of the committee? No, it's a report. Or is that your committee, uh, thank, your report? Thank you, Councillor. As I said, it's a report from me. Ah, from you. It's, okay. um, it's to the Deputy Mayor and Councillors from the Mayor. Uh, that will be, it's tabled now to be circulated uh, tomorrow. Uh, and as I said, next Monday, there'll be a full detailed report. Yes, I'm and just, that yes. would I... Sorry to no, interrupt no, you. Yep. That, yeah, okay. no, you don't get yep. to do that. Take a seat. Okay, thanks. Uh, and that, Councillor James, uh, will be... Uh, uh, my intention is for uh, all five attendees. Now, it has to be circulated. It's been settled. That will be circulated in draft form tomorrow to my four other colleagues for their, uh, for their input and consideration. But as I say, my intention is for that to be tabled. Uh, next uh, next Monday. Yeah, I'm just interested in the first uh, sentence of your report, of your report, which says, um, amongst other things, it's a bionic. Uh, well, it would be iconic, I think. But um, yeah, okay. Yeah, it's not that old. It's not that old. <laughs> but so, anyway, you you've answered my question, thank and that, that is that All right, it's, thanks, it's, it's your report. Jones. Your report. Thank thanks. you, uh, Councillor Mulder. Yeah. The full report. You've said you, that will be tabled at the special council meeting to be held next Monday. Do we as councillors get to see that full report before then? Or that'll, that'll, be, that'll be circulated with the papers. Yep, thank with you. With the papers? The, on Wednesday, as is normal practice. Oh, the Thursday lately. <laughs> well, no, councillors get their papers on a, on a Wednesday. <coughs> OK, well, thanks, Councillor um, Mulder. <coughs> right, Councillor Walker, um, sorry, Councillor Warren. Um, Thank you for that, and I commend those um, councillors who did take the opportunity. I was one of the two who visited last year, um, and I, I would appreciate it if the report could include more information about why it was important to actually be there 
and what, what you saw there that you would not have seen if you had been on a Zoom meeting or had a phone conversation. So um, at the moment there are quite a few adjectives in the report, um, but I'd like there to be some more detail, if this is possible, about what the actual value was of being there. So um, that, that's just a suggestion from yeah, me no, and thank, perhaps thank something you. that Thanks, could Councilor be included Warren. in the broader Thank you, report. so noted. All right, so moving on now to, are there any other questions on this matter? All right, moving on now to 4.3, Council Workshops, as listed in the agenda. Any comments on that at all? All right, moving on now to tabling of petitions, uh, CEO. Uh, there are none, Mayor. Right, thank you. Uh, reports from outside bodies, uh, Councillor Walker, the Copping Refuge Disposal Site Joint Authority. Uh, I should have some minutes to table at the next meeting, I believe. Uh, and for the Member's Interest in Strategic Planning Day of the Southern Way Solutions is happening on Wednesday. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, moving on to uh, TAS Water, there's nothing to report at this time. Uh, the Greater Hobart Committee will be meeting, as I indicated last meeting, um, on the 15th of March. Uh, and I also was going to announce my um, election as uh, Vice President of the so South East Region Development Association CERTA meeting last Thursday, but uh, I was beaten to the punch. Uh, are there any other reports from Council and Special Committees and other representative bodies that colleagues would like to table? Deputy Mayor. Um, thank you, Mr Mayor. I have the pleasure of tabling the events Special Committee meeting minutes from 19th of January 2023. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other? Councillor Chong. Um, I'll table the December minutes for the Richmond Advisory Committee and also a summary of the bicentennial planning. Thank you very much. Mm. Uh, there being no other minutes to be tabled, um, uh, moving now on to weekly briefing reports of the 6th, 13th and 20th of February. They've been circulated. Are there any matters arising? Councillor James. Thanks, I got the nod. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Mayor. Uh, I refer to the 13th of February and to current infringement uh, forward slash uh, enforcement notice. Uh, my question through you to the appropriate officer. <coughs> uh, there seems to be a, a dramatic increase in the number of uh, enforcement notices and infringement notices that have been issued, and on page 24 of that particular issue, uh, it just seems as though uh, uh, in the past we've only had a small number, and I'm just wondering through you to the appropriate officer as to whether or not people may be having some difficulty uh, interpreting or coming forward to discuss things with the council staff or whether they've just decided to go their own way and then suffer the consequences, if I could say that in general. Thank you, Councillor James. Uh, Mr Lovell, with it, with it. Mr Lovell, please. Through you, Mr Mayor. Um, uh, I, would, I think the answer is that around the fact that this is a, a growing council with... Uh, 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 um, 850 to 900 applications per year um, and uh, all sorts of things going on. Uh, it's, not a, it's not surprising that, uh, that uh, there's, in this case, six matters uh, that, are, uh, that are being dealt with as enforcement matters. In the, and in the context of the number of developments we're dealing with, it's actually not very many, I would suggest. Councillor Jones? Uh, yes. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Uh, the 20th of February 2023, the planning appeal decision on 30 Cremorne Avenue uh, in Cremorne. Uh, I'm interested uh, if Mr Lovell could uh, respond to my question, and that is on page two, or oh, actually <coughs> page two of the actual uh, tribunal's decision. It says the agreement proposes that the original application be amended by the substitution of new plans varying the proposal as follows. And it's listing those A, B, C and D. In particular, through you, Mr Mayor, to Mr Lovell, um, the part A is the removal of the upper storey first floor extension and deck. Um, that was uh, handled under delegation, that decision, because the decision was... Uh, even Stephen or six or seven five. So, was that um, a major change to what was determined uh, by the delegation 
in relation to approval of that particular uh, development. Thank you, Councillor James. Mr Love. Uh, through you, Mr Mayor, the, it was, uh, uh, the, uh, the amended plans are significantly different to what was approved by the Council. Um, and it was as a result of the mediation between the parties um, that the uh, applicant offered to make those significant changes. As both parties agreed, we were uh, able to also support it as it still continued to comply with the planning scheme. But it was essentially an arrangement to significantly reduce the size of the building between the parties. Thank you. Thank you. And just as a follow-up to that, uh, is it intended to come back to Council for uh, ratification? Mr Lovell. Through Mr Mayor, no it is not. Um, um, under the delegations that are granted to me, um, um, I signed off that consent agreement so that the, the, the parties who were happy uh, in this case could get on with the project. Thank you, Mr Lovell. Are there any other matters arising? Um, I note that we're at the end of our omnibus uh, items. Can I have a mover for, of the omnibus motion, please? Thank you, Councillor Kennedy. Second to Councillor Chong. Um, all those in, I'll put the motion. All those in favour? It's unanimous. Thank you. Moving now on to item number five, public question time and public questions on notice. I note that we have three questions on notice. We might read the first one, please, General um, Chief Executive Officer. which is Mr Marsh of Bell Reef. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, the first question comes from uh, Mr Marsh of Bell Reef. Um, the question starts uh, with a paragraph narrative, so I'll read that out for context. I received an emailed mayoral letter on the 24th of January 2023 regarding expectations of council meeting behaviour. I responded to the Mayor in a letter dated the 31st of January 2023. In the letter I stated, as Mayor of Clarence, you hold a position of influence and responsibility. Your position brings with it a high level of accountability. I requested that you answer my 2023, sorry, 23rd of January 23 question, which you took on notice and answered on the 6th of January, sorry, 6th of February 2023. I also requested that you apologise to me, your colleagues and the community in the chamber for the rulings and demands you made on the 23rd of January 23, a council meeting. My question is, why haven't you apologised? Well, thank you, CEO, and um, I thank Mr Marsh for his question. And in the interest of transparency, I will table and read the letter that I sent to Mr Marsh on the 24th of January 2023. It reads, Dear Mr Marsh, I wanted to write to you following our interaction at last night's council meeting to provide context and an explanation on the decision I made as chair of that meeting. Since being elected mayor, I have sought to create an environment around the council table that respects differing perspectives and views on how to make this city a better place, with my ultimate desire for the duration of my term being that we always present as our best selves. My aim over the next four years is to create a period of real achievement for our city so that in October 2026, we can all proudly look back and point at tangible wins for our community. While the difference of opinion and the contest of ideas is important for the democratic process, I need elected members and members of the public alike to be mindful of the standard of behaviour expected of us all and for conducting meetings in a respectful manner. Last night, it felt to me that your statement leading up to your second question without notice were seeking to dredge up old issues in an attempt to disparage and embarrass me. This is why I ruled your question as improper and consequently asked you to take your seat. I would also note that I had provided you with discretion on asking the second question given our, given our meeting procedures clearly state that each person in the public gallery will be given an opportunity to ask one question without notice. I respect the passion in which you engage in the democratic process of our council meetings and acknowledge you are a regular and valued contributor of questions with or without notice. I hope to see you in chambers again soon and trust that this letter provides further context for my ruling last night. Yours sincerely, Councillor Brendan Blomley, Mayor of the City of Clarence. Now, I didn't apologise as I felt I had adequately explained both in my letter of the 24th of January <coughs> and, in my sub and at the subsequent council meeting the reasoning for my actions 
as chair of the meeting. However, if Mr Marsh genuinely felt aggrieved by my approach, I apologise. It was and always is my intention to run a meeting with good order and a higher purpose, not to embarrass anyone. Mr Marsh, I hope you and my colleagues can take that in the spirit it is offered. But I would ask you to also reflect, as I have, on how you approach this council, its elected members and staff in the future. As I have said previously, we all have a responsibility to bring our best selves to this place in the interests of our community, and that includes members of the public. I will not allow members of the public, or elected members for that matter, to misuse the questions with or without notice, to take pot shots at elected members or at council staff. This is not what they are there for, and our meeting regulations are clear in this regard. Second question. Um, thank you, Mayor. <coughs> Um, we had uh, two further questions on notice uh, from Mr Walker of Ropeby. Um, the first question was uh, regarding the adjourned council meeting on the 16th of January 23. Uh, the question is, the adjourned council meeting of the 16th of January 2023 uh, notes as being adjourned because of the unavailability of several councillors and attendees. Minutes for this meeting show there was a quorum of councillors and only the manager governance from the usual noted attendees missing. Will all future meetings with this level of attendance be adjourned? And if not, why was this one? Thank you, Chief Executive Officer. The meeting procedures allow for me to adjourn a meeting for a number of reasons, not just on whether we have a quorum or not. In the extraordinary circumstances of four councillors not being able to attend because of a traffic jam on the Tasman Bridge, following consultation with colleagues present, I determined to adjourn the meeting so that all councillors could attend the following week. This was particularly pertinent given, given two of the affected councillors had notices of motion on the agenda that would otherwise have lapsed. And the second question, please. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, the second question relates to the council meeting of the 6th of February 2023. Uh, Mr Walker's question is, the meeting of the 6th of February 2023 at 1 hour 38 minutes on the video recording. After Councillor James made an error with Matthew Healy's name, which could easily be saw past, he was then stopped mid-speech singled out in front of the entire council chambers to highlight this mistake by Mayor Brendan Blomley. Then Mayor Brendan Blomley is heard to continue to say, treat carefully. What was the intent or reasons for this further statement or direction? Thank you, Chief Executive Officer. And I thank Mr Bradley Walker for his question. I corrected Councillor James, as I know he takes great pride in accuracy and wouldn't have wanted a mistake on the Director of Local Government's name to be left uncorrected. I took it by his reaction on the night that he welcomed this intervention. He even thanked me for doing so. So, moving on now to item 5.2, answers to questions on notice. There are none. Uh, questions without notice, 5.4. Are there any questions from the gallery? Sorry? Uh, Is that Chief Executive Officer? Uh, all right. Um, well, I'll start with the front row. Uh, Mr Fig, your name and suburb, please. Thank you, Mr Mayor, and it's uh, great to be acknowledged as a regular here. Uh, Michael Fig of Lauderdale. My question is to do with uh, past consultation and current consultation on Roaches Beach Coastal Management Plan. There's been a lot in the last 10 years about global warming, coastal inundation and erosion. My property is one of the many of the 190 odd kilometres uh, of coastal properties in uh, Clarence. I'd like to know, to simplify the question, everything I've read so far is from the point of view for government and council on almost a retreat policy. 
can the council, through you, Mr Mayor, um, tell us, are we going to be allowed to defend our properties? And if so, will we be hung up on any um, regulations or any matter that may stop us defending our own properties? Mr Pig, thank you for your question. Pleasure. Chief Executive Officer. Um, that will require potentially a fairly detailed answer, <coughs> Mayor, so I will take that question on notice. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the gentleman up the... Thank you. Uh, name and suburb, please. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Nick Cohen, Acton Park. Uh, I've just got a question in regards to the perceived increase in youth crime and antisocial behaviour at numerous shopping centres that have been, uh, been reported on many social media platforms such as Facebook and others. Uh, there are quite a few programs, JCP Youth uh, and Backtrack Youth Works that we could approach uh, and I would be well happy to, to be the lead person on this. Uh, what would Council's position be to provide any funding to allow us to set up a, a program to start helping these youth be nudged back onto the right path uh, and, and hopefully start allowing these kids to, to have a brighter future? Mr Cohen, thank you for your question and your obviously very genuine interest in this important topic. Um, we are heading into our budget process at the moment, but there is, a, there is some work that has been occurring. Uh, Chief Executive Officer, would you like to touch on that? Um, thank you, Mayor. Um, uh, in regard to uh, Council's position, we, uh, we obviously run a youth program and we're in regular contact with uh, a range of service providers as well as Tasmania Police in respect to a number of issues within the city. Um, we'd be, uh, if you're happy to leave some details with, uh, with our secretary, uh, we'll be happy to contact you and, and talk further about what our programs are and also uh, what your, uh, your, you may have access to, plus the, uh, the budget process. Uh, just a, a final... Uh, from the youth that I have spoken to, uh, the police currently uh, the youth feel that there is a, a more heavy-handed approach from police rather than a more consultive process with police getting to know the kids and getting to know why they're in the situations they're in. Uh, and it feels to the youth as, a, as an us versus them. So this is why I'm here and, and wanting to help these kids as best we can to, to everyone's benefit. Mr. Cohen, thank you again. And uh, if you could leave your, make sure you leave your details, please, that, that would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Are there any other people wishing to? Uh, Mr. Marsh, name and uh, uh, Mr. Marsh is the call. Thank you. Yeah. Name and suburb, yeah, please. It's, uh, Victor Marsh from Bill Reeve. Um, before I start, I'd like these photos to be handed round to the alderman so they have an idea what I'm talking about. On the 25th of the 7th, 22, I had a question without notice concerning the condition and safety of the Blunston Arena Light Towers, in particular the sections where the towers are joined. From as early as 2015, I was concerned about rust stains around the joins, see photo one. Uh, from the 24th of the 10th, 18, two large cranes were brought in to stop the park tower from possible collapse after gale force winds the previous day. See photos two, three, four and five. Then all four towers were checked and repaired. If you go to the arena while there's a gale force winds blowing and you eyeball the light banks of the park and beach street towers, you will clearly see these structures swaying quite alarmingly. Recently, devices have been attached to all four towers where they are joined at the middle, see photo six. The users of this arena and the general public have a right to know whether these light towers are safe. Um, my question is, what is the purpose of these devices that have recently been attached? That's my question. Chief Executive Officer. 
Um, thank you, Mayor. Uh, Mr Marsh, may I ask you a question in return? Mm. Uh, have you contacted the Tasmania Cricket regarding your question? No, I haven't, because um, I consider the, um, the, the council here to be landlords. <coughs> Right. Well, so am I asking you to they're, find They're out? the operator of the site and they have primary responsibility for the safety of those towers. Yeah. So they, they are in the best place. Well, we to, have to uh, try that before we, uh, in other... Actually, yeah, so I'm, sorry, Mr. 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 I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, it's not for debate. What, what we will do, though, and the Chief Executive Office has made a suggestion, but what we will do, though, we will contact... We'll take, if, you, if you may take this on notice, we will have a detailed response for you uh, yeah. in the next um, in the next yeah. well, agenda yeah. uh, pack, uh, we will contact the TCA. Uh, uh, sorry, Cricket Tasmania, um, um, and we'll we'll have a we'll have a response for you. So yeah. if we may take that on notice, please. Yeah, yeah. All right, thank you very I much. I prefer you to do it rather than me, because they won't. They won't thank thank you, Mr. Marsh. All right, um, gentleman down the back, please. Yeah, thank you, sir. Yes, please. Uh, name and suburb, please, sir. Uh, Scott Jones, Howrah, Gleeville. Um, I was just wondering if the council would consider delaying changing the speed on Pass Road that I believe is going to occur on the 1st of March um, until uh, some more some community consultation takes place. Uh, I note that there was a petition last year to fix uh, Pass Road to improve the quality of it, which I signed, uh, but I, I know there was no sort of talk of changing the speed limit when that occurred. Uh, well, um Thank you, um, thank you, Mr. Jones. So, Mr. Graham, uh, you are able to, to answer that, please. Sorry, three, three. Mr. Mayor. Um, so, as, as a result of the petition um, last year, um, which Council adopted to approach, um, so the petition asked for a reduction um, in the speed limit, signed by 287 people. Council adopted a position to write to the Transport Commissioner for reducing the speed. Uh, we followed through with that. Um, in January this year, we received a direction from the Transport Commissioner to do that. And yes, we are following through with that for the, for the speed to be changed as of the Wednesday this week. The signs are erected. We've just got to remove uh, the covers from them. And we've been writing to um, stakeholders. We'll be releasing media to social me on their social media platforms and the general media and Facebook um, and our intention at the moment to follow through with the direction from Council's adoption is to follow through with that. Thank you, Mr. Um, Graham. Mr. Jones, I'm sorry, you don't get you only had one chance, but um, there is some discretion to have. So, are there, are there any other questions at all? Uh, Mrs. Marsh, please. Um, my name's Joanne Marsh, and I live in Bell Reef. Um, I received a letter from Council informing me that my hard waste collection day was Wednesday the 15th of February from 6am. Residents were asked to put out waste the evening before or by 6am on collection day. Our area's hard waste collection did not begin until Monday the 20th of February. During this delay, it was windy and passers-by were able to scavenge scattering carefully placed items around. So my question is, uh, what happened to cause the delay in, coll in collection? Thank, thank you, Mrs Marsh. Uh, Mr Graham. Uh, through you, Mr Mayor, um, as I've informed um, councillors, we've been four to five days behind on the hard waste collection due to the volumes of material um, going out. Um, <coughs> the contractor has, when able, to obtain external subcontractors to try and get back on, on schedule. We are still at least four days behind at the moment and we're working as hard as we can through social media to inform um, our rate pays of our um, current timings. Thank, thank you, Mr Graham. Are there any other questions from the gallery? Uh, there, there, there being none, um, I now advise... Oh, sorry, are there deputations? Um, thank you, Mayor. Uh, we have one deputation tonight. Thank you. Find the right page. Uh, our deputation is from Ms Erin Jackson in relation to 52 Surf Road planning application. Thank you. Good evening, Ms Jackson. Three thank minutes. You. And thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. I am Erin Jackson of uh, 52 Surf Road, Seven Mile Beach. Um, I'm here on behalf of myself and my husband, Paul Jackson. Um, he sends his apologies. He's not with me tonight. He actually works for Hobart City Council and didn't think it appropriate to attend 
uh, with me. Um, we are here on behalf of the, the application that we have on our property at 52 Surf Road, 7 Mile. We understand that our application is recommended for refusal relating solely to the garage that is proposed. Um, so that's what my deputation will focus on tonight. Uh, for clarity, it, uh, it covers two pergolas and a garage at this stage. Um, we acknowledge that it currently doesn't comply um, with the setback requirements in the acceptable solutions, but we have adequately addressed the performance criteria as set out in the correspondence we've circulated to all of you and hopefully you've received it. Um, I'd just like to touch on a few points in that correspondence, if I may. The location of the garage in the first place was quite deliberate by us and it was in order to minimise the impact on our neighbours. It is set back five metres from the northwestern boundary, um, exactly for that reason. Um, officers provided an opportunity to withdraw and submit a new application that could be recommended for approval. Um, however, what officers suggested to us um, that was, could, be, could be supported was to construct the garage on the northwestern boundary adjacent to our neighbours. In our view, this created multiple other issues um, that in that it impacts directly on our neighbour at 2 Leyden Avenue. It would require a secondary access off Leyden Avenue <coughs> and it would require the relocational treatment of a fire plug. And in fact, any other location chosen on our property would result in an impact on neighbouring properties. Um, and given that we're lucky enough to have a corner block, we actually chose the option of, of placing it on the street side to minimise any impact on our, on our neighbours. Um, it's worth noting that the verge in Leyden Avenue, adjacent to 52 Surf Road um, and along to Kuru, is exceptionally <coughs> wide, over six metres from the edge of the road to the front boundary fences of those properties. Um, this creates a perception of significant setback from the road already. Um, additionally, in our opinion, all the properties along this street are of similar character in the way that they present to the street. Uh, in that they've all got high fences, about 1.8 metres plus um, gates, and many have significant vegetation that's even higher than some of the fences. So what we are proposing would not have any greater impact um, than what already exists. Um, and it sets no additional precedent than has already been set. We really love this area, the community, the lifestyle opportunities it provides for our young family. Um, and that's why we've worked really hard with our designer to provide a proposal which minimises the impact on the community. And we think that this minimal impact is best demonstrated by the fact that no representations were received from the community. In closing, I'd like to reiterate that this is a discretionary application um, and Council has a right to approve based on satisfaction of the performance criteria and we'd urge the Council to exercise this right. Thank you, right. Thank, Thank you, you very you. much. Right, uh, that, there was only the one deputation. That's right. right thank you. Uh, I now advise that council intends to act as a planning authority under the Land Use Planning and Approvals Act 1993. Moving on to um, agenda item 7.1, development application for 50 East Derwent Highway Rose Bay to multiple dwellings. Is there a mover for the motion? Thank you, Councillor Mulder. Is there a seconder? Councillor Hunter, thank you very much. Councillor Mulder. Straight forward. Councillor Hunter. I have nothing to add. Thank you. Uh, any other colleagues wish to? Uh, Councillor James. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Mayor, and I would have liked to have been able to have uh, some response to either the mover or seconder in this particular matter, but nevertheless, I'll, I'll go with what I have. Uh, would like to draw to the Council's attention. On page 16, it refers to under the acceptable solution for the visual impacts caused by the apparent scale, bulk or proportions of the dwelling when viewed from the adjoining lot. The officers in their wisdom have said that the visual impact of the development would be moderate as a result of the two-storey design and that the proposal is for multiple dwellings within a streetscape typified by single and uh, single storey detached and mid-century dwellings. And, and, and so you have this particular scenario where this particular development, in my opinion, is out of keeping 
with the other buildings in the immediate vicinity. They do go on to say uh, in the performance criteria that the design is to be minimised uh, when viewed from adjoining by cutting the dwelling partially into the rising slope of the site. It may, as it say, it will result in, in a reduction in the height, but nevertheless, it still is of the bulk scale and size that has an impact on the immediate dwellings in the vicinity. Also on page 17, uh, it is proposed in the second paragraph that the footprint, footprint sorry, of the proposed dwelling being only 89 square metres is less than the single storey footprint of the adjoining dwellings. This, even though it is a, a multi-storey dwelling, it is still on a very, very small footprint and that by the very nature still makes it fall within the category of what is apparent and, and probably acceptable for a dwelling like this in the immediate vicinity. Finally, on page 18, uh, with respect to, and this particular acceptable solution doesn't come uh, into the discussion as much as the bulk scale and size, etc. But on page 18, it refers to uh, not cause an unreasonable reduction in sunlight in the existing solar energy uh, insulation on adjoining property. It is acknowledged in the officer's report that the adjoining property located has three rows of solar panels on the roof, although it's saying, and here, it, the shadow cast from Unit 2 will extend over four of these panels, and so there will be some impact in relation to, even though there are still other, other panels on the, in the, on the roof of the property, it will still result in some loss of amenity and solar energy on the insulation. I will not support the proposal. Thank you, Councillor James. Are there any other colleagues wishing to contribute to this matter? Being none, Councillor Mulder, right of reply. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, I take um, note and I thank Alderman James, or Councillor James, for his contribution. Um, but uh, I was had a quick look on the phone whilst I was doing there, the satellite images of the area, and um, <coughs> yes, there are a number of dwellings there where there are multiple dwellings on what were once standard sites. And, um, and the, the commentary about single storey mid-century developments is appropriate because that's what it was. This is not the mid-century. Thank you. Right, thank you, Councillor Mulder. I'll put the motion, uh, all those in favour? Against? So, so carried. Uh, thank you. Moving now on to item 7.2, uh, development application for 52 Surf Road, Seven Mile Beach, two pergolas and a garage slash boat shed. Councillor Kennedy, do you wish to move your alternate motion? Yes, thank you, Mr Mayor. I'd like to move the alternate motion in my name. Thank you. Is there a seconder? Thank you, Councillor Warren. Councillor Kennedy. <coughs> thank you, Mr Mayor, and I'd like to thank Erin for your deputation, put so succinctly, and I'll just recap a little bit on that. Uh, sometimes as a council we get to use our discretion. The rule book is not always right, as you can't always have a one-size-fits-all solution. This application is discretionary. Sometimes a planning matter comes to us with that old-fashioned term, common sense applies, and this is one of them and this must be looked at with common sense. It's a proposed garage behind an existing fence. This application should be approved. This is a growing family living at the beach with bikes, surfboards, kayaks, a boat, two cars, two dogs, living in a village where often these items, not the dogs I hope, <laughs> spill over onto the nature strip. Now you'll see from the photos in the report that there's a lot of cars parked over the nature strips in Laden Avenue. It is that wide. Now, if you haven't visited the site, you won't know what I'm talking about. This will in no way be inconsistent or incompatible with the Seven Mile Beach Village. I've lived in this village for 31 years and have a good understanding of the community. And by the way, I do not know the applicants. This community is well known for scrutinising everything and anything council related. And due to the diligence and care given by the applicants, there was not one objection to this proposal. 
Let's be clear, <clears throat> there is no consistency with street scapes in the village. That's the nature and character of a village. Surely we aren't insisting everything look the same. Safety and not impacting on neighbours is what's important. But in saying that, almost all the properties along the frontage in Leyden Avenue are of similar character in the way they present to the street, in that they nearly all have fences 1.8 metres plus, as we heard earlier, gates, and many have significant vegetation even higher than the fences. This proposal is certainly consistent with what exists currently in Leyden Avenue. Look at the setbacks, and I'll go to page 45 of the report towards the bottom of the page where it states, that I can't read it all, that in an effort to facilitate the development and in addition to consideration of alternative solutions, the opportunity was extended to the applicant to withdraw the current application and submit a new application in full or in part that could be recommended for approval. It's not surprising that the applicant declined this. Why? And please take note of this. Some of the changes suggested by the officers would have severely impacted their neighbours. By moving the location of the garage, the northwestern boundary is suggested by the officers in the applicant's view and that of their planner creates many issues. It directly impacts their neighbour. It would require a secondary access off Laden Avenue where there is one existing already, right where they're planning to put the shed. This makes sense. And it would require, as heard, the relocation or treatment of a fire plug. And as I just said, there's currently an existing access off Leyden Avenue leading straight into the proposed spot for the garage. So at the time of the property being built in the 90s, it was part of the plan then. The current location plan for the shed was deliberately decided upon to minimise the impact of the proposal on any other party, which is why the rear of the garage is set back five metres from the neighbour's boundary, which is why, once again, there's no representations. And remember, the report states not to cause an unreasonable loss of amenity to adjoining owners, which is exactly what the applicants have achieved. In fact, on page 43 of the report, it states, Council's development engineer is of the view that the proposed setback is sufficient to ensure the safety of Rose users is not comprised. compromised. The setbacks of the surrounding buildings are varied and examples of lesser setbacks to frontage boundaries are right throughout the precinct and continue to happen. I can cite some very recent examples. The main issue, the compatibility with the streetscape. I note that image three in attachment four doesn't give a true indication of the streetscape. That's the one with the cars parked all over the nature strips. It's a photo taken down the middle of the road. When looking at how each property from Surf Road to Kuru, along Leyden addresses the street, you can see that this property is the least intrusive in the street. Most of the properties along this frontage have high fences, as mentioned, and to approve this application is just being consistent with what's already there, and the shed would sit behind the existing fence. This decision requires common sense, and I urge my colleagues to understand that the applicants have gone above and beyond to plan for a structure that is a necessity for their growing family, while ensuring that their neighbours are not impacted in any way. I hope you've all visited the site, then you'll know what I'm banging on about. I seek your support in approving this application. Thank you, Councillor Kennedy. Councillor Warren. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor, and thank you, Councillor Kennedy, who has summed up the issue perfectly. I'd like to thank the, the applicant um, for the deputation this evening, which also clarified a number of things. The number of times we've had development applications in this chamber where the um, applicants have not spoken to the neighbours, have not particularly cared about the neighbours, um, to know that all options have been considered and this one has been chosen as the most sensible and the least impact on neighbours. Again, I think common sense prevails. This is not going to hurt anybody. Nobody's going to be upset if we approve this. We're doing a good thing for the family. It's consistent with the streetscape. I think we can use our discretion here. It's behind a fence. What more can I say? Please support this. Thank you, Councillor Warren. Any other? Councillor Hunter. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I will not be supporting Councillor Kennedy's motion tonight. And you spoke to common sense. Yes, a lot of us think, a lot of DAs that come to us that we want to refuse, that it would be common sense not to put a house there or a structure there. But in those instances, we don't have that privilege. In this case, we do. 
We also talked about going above and beyond and doing what's right for the neighbors. Well, I spoke to the applicant today, who I do happen to know, so this is a bit difficult for me. They haven't spoken to the neighbors to see whether it would actually have an impact by moving closer to the boundary. So I'm not going to take that consideration into account because I think there's a bit of room to move there. If you look at page 48, at the conclusion of the councillor's recommendation, council officer's recommendation, it says, council's decision on this application is important as it will prevent a disorderly development pattern relative to the frontage from being established in the streetscape. This might seem really insignificant, and yes, I would say it would. However, I take the officer's recommendation and that it sets a precedent for the future of the neighborhood for the future. And we've all been in the position before where we can't refuse something because the president has already been set elsewhere. So please consider this tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hunter. Councillor Jones. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, on page 40, uh, the officers have quite clearly, as they do on any of the development applications that come forward, uh, and I quote, in determining an application for any permit for use or development, the planning authority must, in addition to the matters required by section 51.2 of the Act, take into consideration two things. Firstly, all applicable standards and requirements in this planning scheme and any representations. So there are no representations. However, the planners have had to look at, at the planning scheme and determine as to whether it fits. And it doesn't. It doesn't fit and they have provided the reasons in relation to it, notwithstanding there were no representations. And that is something that happens from time to time and in this particular case it's quite unusual for there to be no representations but then of course uh, we can take the presenters' uh, comments in relation to that and therefore uh, there was not put forward. On page 43, and I've actually highlighted a couple of things here on page 43. The officers in viewing or in uh, interpreting or in following through with the acceptable solutions, D, the appearance when viewed from roads and public open space adjacent to the site the and the streetscape is characterised by landscape front gardens and nature strips. The location of the boundaries would, of the garage would not enhance these characteristics of the site, adjoining lots and streetscape. Under safety of road users, although the development engineer is of the view, in conclusion though, and that wasn't mentioned by one of the previous speakers on that very topic about the council's development engineer is of the view that, in conclusion, the proposed development is unable, is unable to satisfy the performance criteria and does not comply with this standard. We don't like to knock these things back, but then again, we have to work within the planning scheme. And the planning scheme is quite clear and the officers have gone into chapter and verse in this particular case to address acceptable solutions and then follow through with the performance criteria. And in conclusion, they have said in their last paragraph, although no representations have been received, council's decision on this application is important, is important as it will prevent a disorderly development pattern relative to the frontage from being established in the streetscape in a beautiful coastal area, which by all intents and purposes has maintained this sort of streetscape. And then in this particular case, I believe the officers have got it right. And if this motion is lost, I foreshadow the officers' recommendation. Thank you, Councillor James. Um, Councillor Hume. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I've really had to grapple with this one because um, I can see both sides of the argument and I was genuinely undecided on this development when I walked into this chamber. Now, I can appreciate um, the comment that regardless of whether any representations are received, 
it's still important that we understand the provisions of the planning scheme, that we apply the planning scheme. Uh, because when it comes to the uh, acceptable solution and performance criteria in relation to um, street frontage and setbacks, when, when you have the criteria related to uh, a setback being compatible with um, the rest of the street, um, if, you, if you don't apply that standard, then the setback that you create then becomes the new standard. Because once you have a, a setback that's close to the street frontage, the rest of the, the street can you know, put in similar developments according to that performance, those performance criteria. Having said that, the argument then comes down to, well, what are, what are the standard setbacks um, in that street. Uh, now, the, the applicant uh, made the observation that there are buildings in the street with uh, similar setbacks. Um, looking at attachment three, which is on page 62 of the agenda, uh, it seems to me that the buildings are, are slightly further set back. However, maintaining a, a streetscape in terms of where buildings lie could be of great importance if you have a, a streetscape that's characterised by, by open yards, which Layden Avenue is a bit further up the street. However, the particular section, as uh, Councillor Kendi observed in her very comprehensive um, contribution on this uh, development, it's a section that's characterised by high, fa high fences close to the street. Um, and it's because of this, and given that the, uh, the proposed shed sits behind one of those high fences, uh, because of this character, um, I don't believe that the proposed shed has the potential to impact on this character. Um, I do believe that it complies with the relevant performance criteria, and I will be supporting the motion moved by Councillor Kennedy. Thank you, Councillor Hume. Councillor Mulder. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, we need to get understand that the new planning scheme imposed upon this area the concept of a low density residential village style. <laughs> but this village long predates that kind of planning scheme and is in actual fact more akin to a residential suburb with which we're surrounded here. So the practicalities are that as far as new developments or new subdivisions in the precinct is concerned, yes, that's the time to impose these sorts of things. Now, um, here we have a development that doesn't fit the new prescription, but clearly would have fitted the previous prescription. But it could. It could fit the new prescription, but if it did, there'd be this immediate impact upon neighbours. And if we did amend the plans and they were advertised according to what they could meet the prescription, London to a brick would have had more, would have had probably some representations about it. But if you have a look at this thing, there's so much focus post on the street, streetscape. But what it, what, what it actually says, it talks about the area, not just necessarily the street, but the whole area. And there are many buildings that fit this prescription in the area. So in that case, would, would we, it would be so wrong if we amended this application to impose upon people impacts that they don't want and they don't need and that aren't necessary. And that's why it's called discretion. It might be black letter law, but it's not common sense. Now we, so. The streetscape of this particular area, as well as the area, it's the size of the fences and the size of the nature strips. We heard tonight six metre setbacks before you hit the boundary, and then we're going to impose an arbitrary other setback on this thing. And given the rate right of the nature strips and a quick look at the, at the photographs, we'll show you that, you know, the extensive tree coverage hides these areas. You can't see these buildings 
because of the streetscape, because of the trees and all the rest of it. And I would certainly be, able to be not one for suggesting we start cutting some trees down to improve the streetscape. So um, I think this is a common sense. I understand the argument and I understand the passion for people for the planning scheme and not trying to set a precedent. I'm sorry, this is not a precedent. This is following many, many precedents. Are there any other colleagues wishing to make a contribution? There being one, Councillor Kennedy, right up the plane. <coughs> thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, I'd just like to thank my colleagues for their contributions tonight. I will add that my time on Council four years and however many months we're into, um, I've used the term common sense once. I will not apologise for using it tonight because this is the one time where common sense must prevail. I can't make it any clearer than that. Um, I seek council support. Thank you, Councillor Kennedy. So, colleagues, uh, uh, item 7.2, the alternate motion moved by Councillor Kennedy, seconded by Councillor Warren. I put the alternate motion. All those in favour? Thank you. And against? That, that's so carried. Thank you. Moving now on to item 7.3, development application uh, for 1 slash 272 Carilla Street, Tranmere. Uh, there's an amended recommendation um, that has been circulated. Uh, and I understand that's on the screen now. Thank you very much. Uh, I ask for a, um, a mover of this amended recommendation, please. Thank you, Councillor Hume. Second, Councillor Kennedy. Thank you, Councillor Hume. Oh, no. Councillor Kennedy, do you wish to no, thank speak you, Mr. this? Mayor. Any colleagues wishing to speak to this amended recommendation? Uh, just to... Uh, thank you, Councillor James. Uh, to highlight the fact that at the briefing on Friday, I did suggest that we ought to take that out as a condition and drop it in at, under advice. And I think that is a good measure. It's e exceptional because we have done that in the past with another application that came in this place some a couple of meetings ago, there was that uh, distinction, and I drew it to Council's attention at the time, that was advice. <coughs> in this particular case, thank you for putting it in under advice and not as a condition. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor James. It was a very productive agenda briefing on Friday. And thank you for your, uh, as always, thank you for your contribution. <laughs> thank you. Any other colleagues? <laughs> Councillor Warren, thank you. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I'd just like to state my concern over applications like this. The applicant actually requested um, a maximum of 10 people in a three-bedroom house. We're <coughs> giving advice of no more than 12, which is consistent with the building code. But that seems to me like a lot of people in an Airbnb-type property, short-stay accommodation. Um, I'm trying to imagine what combination of people would have 12, up to 12 people in three bedrooms. Would that be three two-children families? Would it be 12 people under the age of 20 but over the age of 18? Um, I have concerns. Um, I, I don't feel that I can reject this, but I will be interested to see whether it generates a lot of complaints from the neighbours. Thank you, Councillor Warren. As I, um, coming from a family of eight, I hear what you're saying. So, <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Councillor Mulder. Um, I'm tempted to go into how many of the 11 children fitted into the two-bedroom squalors that my grandparents raised them in. But anyway, um, um, I'm not a fan of Airbnb, and I think that might be quite obvious. Um, I don't like the way that they're, um, you know, we hire them out for, for, for one night and we have 400 people turn up to a big party that goes on to the wee small hours of the morning, but even so it's OK as long as no more than 12 of them sleep there that night, apparently. And if they do, um, who's going to be enforcing it? But this is not what this is about. Here we have a planning matter. This is a permitted use. It ain't, it ain't great. Um, and all the rest of it, and I too, um, as the agenda brief will, have, uh, will show, is that um, I too was a bit concerned that we were trying to put limits to how many people could stay there when the planning scheme has no such limits, and therefore we would be putting on conditions that were unenforceable and that could be challenged and, um, and, and would make a mockery of conditions. That's why it's so important that these things go into the advice, because they ask for 10, 
but the building code says it's designed for 12. I have yet to hear of anyone who got prosecuted for having more than 12 people stay in a three bedroom <laughs> detached dwelling. So um, I'm not too sure that those conditions, whoever asked for them might be the case. So this is a simple case of, we don't have any option here. Um, this is really a matter for the state government to get to grips with in terms of how they're used, what they're used for and how to deal with them. And as with most things, that would probably be done through the planning scheme. But the planning scheme is not an instrument of this council. It's an instrument signed by the Minister for Planning. All we do is enforce his directions. Thank you, Councillor Mulder. Deputy Mayor, Councillor Ritchie. Uh, thank you. Just um, to briefly, um, in fact, follow on from Councillor Mulder. Um, yes, I think, and my colleagues would have heard me speak on this matter before, Airbnb, short stay accommodation, whatever term you like to use, um, is becoming more and more of a pickle for us to manage throughout the city. And, of course, we have the same problem um, arising in other municipalities who are struggling to deal with this issue. Clearly, the highly deregulated nature of this industry now, I mean, it's, you know, what it started out as has most certainly changed. We have a situation now where businesses are popping up next to people everywhere throughout communities. We look at the numbers that we see coming through approved by uh, delegation beca and uh, because there's very little we can do about them. It's very frustrating. Um, looking forward to bringing forward my motion. Still working. Uh, we've seen very recently the planning uh, commissions uh, handing down their decision in relation to Hobart uh, City Council. So I'm looking forward to continuing to work with uh, our council officers to put forward the best motion I can uh, at, at a forthcoming meeting. I do think um, there needs to be a broad discussion um, around short-stay accommodation. Uh, state government needs to start realising this is more of a problem than they would like to admit and start uh, having the conversation, opening the doors to that conversation because it's not going to go away. It's just going to continue to... Uh, it's certainly at these sorts of levels where we've got 10, 12 people, three-bedroom uh, house, I can better you, Mr Mulder. My mother grew up in a house of 13, three bedrooms, but nevertheless, uh, that was... They weren't making any money out of it. Sorry, Councillor Mulder. Uh, so, uh, yes, um, we, have, we do have very limited tools in respect of this, uh, these matters, and we are in a difficult situation in very often uh, approving things that we have little little capacity to change. So that's unfortunate and um, naturally um, I won't be opposing the motion but uh, share the concerns of colleagues. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Councillor Ritchie. Uh, Councillor Darko. Um, I would like to thank the Deputy Mayor for her statements just now and summary of the general situation. Um, likewise, I am very opposed to the idea of us approving whole home short-stay accommodations without a greater understanding of the impacts um, it is my view that potentially the uh, general residential function of the Strata Scheme is potentially impacted by the visitor accommodation, but as I don't believe we would have grounds for actually challenging that, I have no choice but to regrettably support this. Thank you, Councillor Darko. Any other colleagues wish to make a contribution? Councillor Hume, your right of reply, please. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I thank colleagues for a, a wide-ranging discussion about the planning scheme um, as we would like to see it. Um, I think it's worth noting that uh, for Tasmania, the visitor accommodation is, is incredibly significant, and when people visit our house, we, uh, our state, sorry, our state, um, we do... <laughs> no conflict. <laughs> we do need to um, have a place to house them, and... Uh, you know, in addition to, um, we do have a housing and homelessness crisis in Tasmania. Um, in addition to the issue of uh, residential properties being converted to visitor accommodation, we also have um, a large number of unoccupied uh, properties uh, throughout um, throughout southern Tasmania. Uh, and, and yes, you know, we do need to address that. I, I would like to see the development of more um, formal accommodation. To, you know. 
because I still want I still want these visitors to come. I still want them to spend money here, and I still want them to generate economic activity that's going to give people jobs and, and then the opportunity to um, you know to buy their own homes or live in their own homes. Um, but uh, yeah, as that's that's something that we'll you know these issues are something that we'll be grappling with um, as a council for many years and in um, many other motions. But uh, as everyone's observed, this is a straightforward planning scheme matter and um, this development complies with the scheme. Yep. Thank you, Councillor Hume. Um, so colleagues, I put the amended recommendation moved by Councillor Hume, seconded by Councillor Kennedy. All those in favour? Against? Thank you, so carried. Moving now on to item 7.4, which is a development application at 34 Carilla Road, Linders Fund for secondary residents. Uh, I call for a sec a mover. Councillor James. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Mr. Mayor. Uh, and uh, I'll just see if there's a second. Oh, yes, yes, of course. Councillor Chong, thank you. Councillor James, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Look, it's um, one of these matters that uh, started out with a granny flat as being proposed <laughs> as part of the process, and uh, that got bogged down in a lot of red tape, to be honest, and it really uh, disadvantages many people in that respect. Nevertheless, the secondary residents must share with the existing dwelling all access, parking and water, sewerage, gas, electricity and telecommunications. That is, goes without saying, and it's important that it be in conjunction with the other uh, facilities within the, within the house, uh, within that particular uh, residence as part of the secondary one. So I seek council support. Thank you, Councillor James. Councillor Chong? Thank you. Uh, colleagues, any other colleagues wish to make a contribution? <coughs> there would be no, no, no need for right of reply then. Uh, I'll put the motion. Uh, all those in favour? So carried. Thank you. <coughs> I'm sorry? Oh, sorry. Was there anyone against? Thank you. CEO? No, that's <coughs> unanimous then. Thank you. Noting we have one person as of the chamber, but unanimous. So Council now concludes its deliberations um, as a planning authority. Moving now on to um, item uh, 8.2.1, the Draft Tasmanian Waste and Resource Recovery Strategy 2022 to 2025. There's a recommendation. I call for a move of the recommendation. Councillor James, thank you. Is there a seconder? Councillor Walker, thank you. Uh, Councillor James. Yes, it's been through the process and as, as I mentioned at the briefing on Friday, I thought that there should be a little bit more uh, discussion within the ranks of us around this table, but nevertheless, it's been out. Uh, it's noted that the, the um, CEO, General Manager, has actually, uh, in his submission, has, has actually spelt out Mr Mayor in, in detail. So I see council support. Thank you, Councillor James. So Councillor Walker. Yeah, it's the Tasmanian Waste and Resource Recovery Strategy. It's it's not mine. Um, there are things I disagree with it, um, but overall I agree with the direction. Uh, if we look at some of the targets, they are capital A aspirational, um, but whilst we might not get there, setting those targets and doing as going as, as quickly as we can to try and get there, I think is a really important uh, matter. So um, I think uh, weighing things up, uh, this is the most positive document I've seen in this space, not without its flaws, and I'm not, I could spend the next uh, 45 minutes going through them. I won't. <coughs> uh, I just seek uh, colleagues' support. Thank you, Councillor Walker. Councillor Warren. Thank you, Mr Mayor. It's pleasing to see the change from waste management to resource recovery and recognising that waste is a resource that actually has a value and can be repurposed. And you only have to drive around Clarence at the moment and see the hard waste out for collection. And because of the delay in collecting, as we discussed earlier, um, it, there has been a reasonable amount of uh, people collecting things that they can reuse. So uh, that has actually worked in the favour of things not going into landfill because people have seen them as, as valuable things. And I did actually see a post on social media about somebody who had bought something. It wasn't 
what they needed, so they're just putting it out into hard waste, and I, I don't think that's the, the purpose of hard waste. These are things that do need to be reused, so it's good to have a strategy as to how we can treat our waste as a resource. Thank you, Councillor Warren. Are there any other colleagues wishing to make a contribution? There being none, I'll, I'll put the motion. Um, moved by Councillor James, seconded by Councillor Walker. Oh, sorry, Councillor James, right of reply. No, thank you. Uh, uh, all those in favour? That's unanimous. Thank you very much. Uh, I note that there's uh, no uh, financial management issues under 8.3. Moving on to 8.4 of governance. The quarterly report to the 31st of December 2022 be received as a recommendation. I call for a mover. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. A seconder. Thank you, Councillor Kennedy. Uh, Deputy Mayor. Um, just as per the recommendation. Thank you, Councillor Kennedy. Uh, Councillor James. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, I'd like to refer Council to page five of the um, quarterly report. And with respect to the Kangaroo Bay <coughs> development, uh, are we on track to buy it back? Thank you, Councillor Jones. If you take your seat, I'll um, ask the CEO to, to answer that question. Chief Executive Officer. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, short answer is yes. Um, as you're aware, we um, are expecting the consultation to be completed by the 6th of March and for Council to be briefed. And uh, if there is a decision required by Council, that will occur at the 20th of March meeting. Thank you very much. Councillor James, a second? A second. Thank, thank you, Mr Mayor. We can go to page 11 <coughs> in relation to Kangaroo Bay Development Precinct this time. Uh, it's the sale of the land is currently being negotiated with the developer. What is the current state of play in relation to that? Thank you, Councillor James. Chief Executive Officer? I might defer to... Oh, Mr Pask, Pask thank you. Uh, you, Mayor, uh, as councillors would be aware, we have, have briefed uh, the elected members on uh, the latest status of the negotiation. We are continuing those with the preferred developer and when we are um, at a position where we can prevent, present a final agreement, we'll bring that back to Council. Thank you, Mr Pascoe. Councillor James. Finally, finally. yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, still on the same subject in relation to Kangaroo Bay. Um, perhaps Mr Case could explain how we're going with the Council-initiated survey and as to whether or not some of the results will be highlighted or um, projected onto the uh, Council's website <laughs> so we can see what... Hopefully, the outcome may be from that exercise. Thank you, Councillor James. Mr. Pask. Through you, Mayor, uh, we intend to bring back uh, that, that. Sorry, that consultation is closed now. Uh, we've been analysing the um, numerous responses we received from the community. We intend to bring uh, those results to Council at its workshop next Monday uh, for that information for then it to be included in uh, a report back to the community following that briefing. Thank you, Mr. Pask. Uh, any other colleagues? Ms. Uh, sorry, Councillor Hume, excuse me. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I refer to page 47 of the report um, and the uh, action items in relation to uh, strategic plan number 3.1, development of the economic development strategy and implementation of the economic development <coughs> plan. Um, I just wanted to um, refer to the previous plan, which I was quite um, instrumental in um, pursuing council to, to develop and adopt. And uh, I was wondering uh, if there are um, actions, in, if, if there are actions in that plan that aren't carried over to the, um, the new plan, um, does council cease to pursue those actions? Um, and, uh, you know, are, are there actions that, that won't be pursued from the previous plan? Um, and, uh, you know, do we, do we have a chance to review those? Thank you, Councillor Hume. Chief Executive Officer. Uh, thank you. I suspect that's a very complicated question, <laughs> so I'll take it on notice. Thank you. Mr Pass, do you wish to add anything to that at all? Able to provide an update. We are officers are working through the draft of the city future strategy, and happy to offer um, to uh, brief councillors on the differences between the strategy and the um, the old economic development plan to make sure that we pick up uh, where necessary and uh, clearly note where we uh, are ceasing to act on um, the previous plan. Thank you, Mr. Pass. Councillor Hume. 
Any other? Councillor Walker. Thank you, and I think uh, compliments to Mr Pasch on how the plan has evolved and, and the presentation. Um, at the very least, even if the numbers get worse, they look prettier, so that's something <laughs> I suppose. Um, I want to just uh, thank colleagues. Uh, I uh, moved an adjustment in July around working with vulnerable people. It was a topical issue uh, through last year, and I think the approach struck, which is the um, voluntary reporting. You've got a choice if you're registered and you want to let people know that it's re re recorded, as is done on page 70, and I thank colleagues that uh, decided to participate in this. Thank you. Thank you, <coughs> Councillor Walker. Any other questions at all from colleagues? There being none, uh, right of the pike, Deputy Mayor, Councillor Ritchie. I thank colleagues for their contributions and uh, hope you support the motion. Thank you. Thank you very much. I put the motion then. Uh, all those in favour? So carried. Oh, that's unanimous. Thank you very much. Moving now on to 8.4.2, the, the first of our three um, uh, draft strategies, the first one being uh, the draft digital strategy for 2023 to 2033, consultation, feedback and strategy approval. There's a recommendation. Uh, call for a mover of the recommendation, please. Thank you, Councillor Kennedy. Uh, second, uh, Councillor Hume, thank you. Councillor Kennedy, do you wish to speak to uh, this? Not really, thank you, Mr Mayor. I, you know, we're noting the feedback from... Sorry about that issue. Um, um, yes, I, I, as per the recommendation for noting. Thank you, Councillor Hume. Thank you very much. Are there any other colleagues wishing to make a contribution? Councillor Walker. Thank you. Uh, and at risk of being considered a stick in the mud, uh, what I'll say on this is firstly the good, which is um, the approaches that seems to have been done with these strategies was to get them out early to us before going out to consultation. Uh, I think the calibre of, um, and I, I, I don't fault the calibre <laughs> of the work done beforehand. Um, and I note the opportunity we were provided to provide feedback. Um, however, uh, these are strategic documents. They sit, if you like, below the strategic plan. The strategic plan was moved in the council chambers in April 2021. The one meeting that I didn't attend because I was furloughed for other reasons. Um, and there were issues, even though it was passed unanimously, uh, it probably would have been 11-1 if I was there. Um, the reason that I will be abstaining for this motion 8.4.3 and 8.4.4 doesn't relate to the calibre of the work done, but it relates to the fact that strategic documents are fairly heavily weighted instruments. They are, they, if you like, set the direction for council. They certainly will be weaponised to ensure things that are in there are committed or used as a leaping board to justify council going into new services and suites of services. They're important documents. Uh, and tonight, um, Crimea River on the smallest violin is the 11th anniversary of my swearing into council. And I raise that just for the mere fact that there's been a few strategies that have come to me in that time and several that have come a couple of times. In each of those occasions, these documents are things that when we get to the end process are discussed as part of the workshop process. I think that is incredibly important. Um, Often it's just a 10 minute PowerPoint presentation, some questions will arise, sometimes directions change a little. Uh, I certainly benefited each time from, uh, if not making my own suggestions, at the very least listening to those of others uh, that often um, lead down another line of questioning or another line of thought and inquiry. And that opportunity doesn't arise when you just decide to or not to submit your own feedback. So I'm not suggesting that we pulp these documents, but uh, on the basis that I believe strategies are documents of weight, uh, on the basis that I've said from the get-go that I don't think the workshop process is where it should be, I'll be abstaining on these. And if there is not a majority vote on these matters, which probably won't happen, but in the case that it does, then I will be calling for these to uh, be held over until uh, they are covered in a workshop. Thank you for your forbearance. Thank you, Councillor Walker. Uh, does any other colleague wish to make a contribution? Councillor Warren, thank you. Um, 
Yes, yeah, so I share all, um, Councillor Walker's concerns that we haven't had a chance to discuss the final results of the consultation. Um, I wonder uh, through you, Mr Mayor, what opportunities there are to review this as we go along. It's a 10-year strategy, so I presume there will be an opportunity to revisit it, uh, particularly as Council evolves over the next few years. We'll have, possibly have three different councils in that time. So even if we approve this tonight, it won't necessarily be the final product. We will have an opportunity to um, tweak it as we go along. Thank you, Councillor Warren. Chief Executive Officer. Um, thank you, Mayor. Um, look, I can add uh, some further colour to that, if that helps. Um, these documents I would regard as living documents. They'll be subject to um, development of implementation plans. Um, and as a consequence, I would expect Council to be talking uh, with reference to them on an annual basis as we develop those plans and we budget. Uh, and if there are changes needed to the strategy document <coughs> itself, then that can be triggered through, uh, through decisions of council or uh, advice through the budget process. Does any other colleague wish to? Council Mulder, thank you. Well, thank you, and um, I echo the concerns that we have about a strategy document, but it's not a piece of legislation. It's, it's something that, you know, living, breathing, aspirational, sets general directions, and, and as, 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 a, as an elected member of a council with a four-year term, I do have some difficulty about doing a 10-year strategy document that isn't heavily caveated with the idea is that it has to live, breathe, develop, grow, and in many cases, die <laughs> as the world changes and as things move forward. But if you don't have a pathway, when are you going to take the first step? Any other colleagues wish to make a contribution? There'd be no cats. The candidate you wish to. Mm. Thank you, Mr. Play? Mayor. Um, just following on from the previous speakers, um, that was my. That has always been my interpretation. I think um, very early on in my early days on council, I did ask the question: In this modern, fast-moving, flexible world, are we dealing with documents that remain live and we can work with them as we move through? Which is why this has my support. Thank you. Thank you. I'll put the motion in. Uh, moved by Councillor Kennedy, seconded by Councillor Hume. All those in favour? Those against? You have saying? Thank, thank you, Councillor Walker. Moving now on to uh, eight, agenda item 8.4.3, the draft cultural creative strategy of 2023 through the 2033, consultation feedback and strategy approval. Call for a mover of the recommendation, please. Thank you, Councillor Chong. Thank you, Councillor Kennedy, a second. Oh, Councillor Chong. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I will be brief. Um, we often talk about the core business of Council being road rates and rubbish, but I'm a firm believer that the arts and culture are the glue that make us a community rather than just a place where people live. And it's really important as a council that we have a strategy about how we want to see ourselves in that space and what we plan to do going forward. As Councillor Mulder perfectly said a few moments ago, if we don't have a strategy, how do we take the first step? If we don't have a strategy, how do we decide what we're going to do in this space? I seek my colleague's support. Thank you, Councillor Tom. Councillor Kennedy? No, thank you, Mr Ben. Contributions from other colleagues? Councillor Walker? Same as last time, but slightly mm -hmm. different. Um, yeah, look, my uh, compliments to its presentation. is in the art space and it absolutely nails it uh, as far as presentation goes. And it is indeed an important sector and a sector that often gets overlooked. Um, and I think that a document with this much work in it is worthy of, uh, you know, being discussed and uh, reviewed as an iterative process as a group prior to, prior to final sign-off. I think it's worthy of that. And as such, it's not being given that. And as per last time, I'll be abstaining on this one as well. Thank you, Councillor Walker. Contributions from any other colleagues? Councillor Chong, would you like to know? Or rather, I'll put the motion, thank you, and that is that um, as moved by Councillor Chong. All those in favour? Against? Abstaining. Thank you, Councillor Walker. Moving now on to item 8.4.4, the draft sustainability strategy 2023 to 2033, consultation feedback and strategy approval. The recommendations before us call for a mover, and I think that might be Councillor James. 
I'll just see whether you have a second seconder. at first. Uh, thank yes, you. I'm not. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Warren. Councillor James, the floor is yours. Yeah, look, thank you very much, Mr Mayor. Look, I am pleased that on page 17, uh, 16, 17, councils plugged into Tasmania's ex expanding electric highway. And already, I think uh, we are starting to make our name. And I also, I understand that one of the movers and shakers in this particular industry is looking at all other locations within our fine city to install one of these electric charging stations. Also on page 17, it is with great delight that a group of us are on council back when we moved to have energy efficient LED lights installed in the city, how well that has progressed. There's been enormous savings, as you'd be aware, Mr Mayor, as, as you were, I think, and even, uh, I was going to call her Alderman Chong, Councillor <laughs> Chong, and others who are in this place back prior to 2018. Because, uh, 2000, yes, 2018, because we were trendsetters. And I would like to finish on that point and just um, pose a question through you to Mr Graham, who has been the officer who has spearheaded this thing for, on behalf of the elected members <coughs> as to how we are heading. And also, you have said in your report that the upgrade are predicted to reduce by four uh, 4,022 tonnes over the next 20 years. Is he able to sort of give us a, a sort of an estimate of what that particular number would be uh, within that timeline? So, Councillor James, just to be clear, this is regarding the installation of the LED lights throughout the city and the... OK. Yes, Mr Graham, do you require any further clarification? Or? Uh, no, I threw him a span. No, I, I can't you. give that information um, right at the moment, but we certainly I'll take that one on notice um, so I can um, inform the... Um, all of them some accurate information. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Mr Graham. Uh, <laughs> any, oh, sorry, Council Warren. Yes, oh, sorry, seconder. Thank, thank you. you. It's good to be talking about sustainability and just to remind colleagues this is about sustainability of the environment, not just technology. <coughs> and I'm reminded of the quote about um, the introduction of the telephone where the mayor of the city said, what a great invention. I can see the day when every city will have one. <laughs> um, so, yes, we have one charging station. Let's, let's go on from there. Um, but in terms of sustainability, there's a lot more to talk about. Um, I expect that this particular strategy will change out of all sight in the next couple of years um, as we get to grips with some of the, the challenges facing this, this city. Thank you, Councillor Warren. Councillor Hunter. Very excited to see this report and I commend the officers on drafting it. Well done. Just a question, if I may, through you, Mr Mayor. On page 19, under the heading Adapting to a Warming Climate, it notes, continue to identify and implement climate change adaptation methods to address impacts on our coastline resulting from sea level rise. Sounds good. I just wanted to, uh, if the CEO could please confirm whether implementation of the plan will be in accordance with Council's policies and actions such as Council's endorsed coastal hazard policy. Thank you, Councillor Hunter. Uh, Chief Executive Officer. Uh, through you, Mayor. Um, thank you for the question, Councillor Hunter. Um, the short answer is uh, yes. Um, the, and it's probably worth uh, talking about this in the broader expanse of all of our strategies. Uh, strategies set the direction for council and our policy framework tells us uh, where those boundaries are and how we're going to, uh, to achieve that strategy. So in the context of sea level rise, council already has that approved coastal hazards management policy that will continue to underpin how we go about developing um, our actions in response to the strategy. Thank you, Councillor Hunter. Are there any other contributions from colleagues? Councillor Darko. Matt, um, I also want to commend the um, council officers for their construction of this report. Um, I want to particularly highlight that I'm so pleased to see a commitment to setting a carbon target and to reducing greenhouse gas emissions, alongside the acknowledgement that we can't, as a state, sit back and rely on the offsets of the forestry sector and um, the forests that we have in place. Um, it's really, really heartening to see Council acknowledge that we do need to reduce emissions in all of the carbon producing sectors. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Darker. Any other comments from colleagues? 
Councillor Walker. Yes, another abstention, but uh, want to do the throat clear around the fact that this is a significant uh, high calibre document that is worthy of uh, further discussion before sign off in the iterative process of workshops. Thank you. Any other colleagues wish to make a contribution? Before I ask, I invite Councillor James to, um, his, for his right of reply, I'll ask the Deputy Mayor to take the chair for a moment. I'd just like to say, uh, a place on the record, um, um, I think I can speak on behalf of uh, most of us, if not all of us, and just thank um, Mrs Doubleday for the amount of work that she and her team have done in, uh, in this, um, in this uh, strategy space. As we know, um, nearly two years ago, uh, we adopted our strategic plan. Uh, there has been uh, a number of iterations of all three uh, um, strategies before us this evening. There's been extensive community consultation, as there ought to be. So to Mr Pask and his team as well, thank you. On a job very well done. Um, I am very comfortable that the documents before us this evening hold us in very good stead and are quality documents. So I would just like to um, also make the point that they were such a high calibre that when they were sent out to us elected members, there was, um, uh, there was uh, well, I was going to say no, but there may have been minimal feedback uh, from elected members because, uh, because of the calibre of these three documents. So, um, so yeah, to you, uh, to Mrs Doubleday, to Mr Pask and, and everyone else involved, thank you very much because these really, um, they are quality documents, as I say. Having said that, I'll take the chair back. Thank you. And um, Councillor James, would you like a right of reply? Thank you, Councillor James. I'll put the motion. Uh, all those in favour? Uh, against or abstaining? Thank you very much, Councillor Walker. Okay, thank you, colleagues. Moving now on to uh, item 8.4.5, the Future of Local Government Report Options Paper Submission. There's a recommendation uh, before us this evening. Uh, thank you, Councillor Walker. As mover, is there a seconder? Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, Councillor Walker. Uh, thank you. Oh, excuse me, there is a, sorry, just, sorry, just to be clear, there was an amended recommendation. Yep. That, that should be up on the screen, I apologise, it's there now. Thank you very much. Uh, and for those playing at home, the amended recommendation basically, uh, I think more than anything, note of, um, really spells out that um, this paper contains feedback, feedback from officers and submissions from individual aldermen that, that have been compiled together. Some of them are contradictory, not many, um, but it's really important to emphasise that this is not the collective view arrived by council, but it's been <coughs> an opportunity for uh, opinions to be um, percolated and raised through. Um, this paper is, uh, I think it was the, the uh, number three options paper we were, or stage two, it's it listed here that we sent our responses to. Uh, I commend the board for the level of consultation they have been taking. There's been some gaming around uh, suggestions that they've only been held in about seven municipalities. Well, um, the thing is that in the metro area, they didn't need to hold it in every single metro council. Uh, I had the opportunity and went to the uh, participation approach in Kingborough, and I understand some of my colleagues took the same approach in Sorrell, and uh, that some others eschewed dag with dogs on regatta day and participated by Zoom. So, um, and that has actually been what they've done the whole way through. So, I expect that when they get to the final, um, iter the final recommendations at some point later this year, that there will be howls of um, there wasn't enough consultation. I think there was a fair bit of consultation, it's just how much participation occurred. And I think there's been a really relaxed approach by a lot of councillors to just, oh, we'll just wait and see, we'll wait and see, we'll wait and see. And uh, I don't recommend that because you're just, you're just going to wake up at the final destination and say, oh, that's awesome or I don't like it. You, we have a responsibility uh, with our collective experience to be really trying to help shape um, what, what this sector's about. So. Um, I, uh, again, I don't agree with um, some of my colleagues' contributions. I don't agree with some of the officers' contributions, but I do uh, agree with the level of thought that's gone into all of it, and I think that that's going to really help inform some decision-making. Uh, I'm just... Uh, with my uh, contributions that I enthusiastically uh, sent to staff here right on the, the dying day, I perhaps could have expressed myself a little better on a couple of... Um, 
uh, matters. And with your indulgence, <coughs> I'm just going to list out some changes so that it reads a little bit clearly. On page 35, paragraph 3, I'm requesting a slight change so that it will say, allowing councils to do things differently, such as their suite of services and delivery models, should be welcomed. Um, another one on page 37. At right at the, which is in the first box in the last sentence, which is change boundary consolidation. It will read now, boundary consolidation would need to be strategic. <coughs> Full stop. Carving off a section of one council to prop up the finances of another is not strategic, democratic or responsible. And we can repeat that again because it is repeated again in the very last box on page 39. Uh, in relation to page 37, I made some... Uh, comments on the final paragraph, uh, which reads opportunities less than urban council. So in the one that starts with opportunities less than urban councils, the next sentence will read, some would believe this is a satisfactory trade-off for better representation and concentrated economic activity in local communities that small rural councils generate. And that is something that you do here in some of the really small councils. They understand that there could be big savings, but many in those communities are saying we would rather we would rather eschew that for the for the fact that so much of the economic activity of a council uh, is concentrated in their hometown. So that is that is a point of view that that, that people are allowed to raise. Um, so uh, it's going to be really interesting where this this comes to. Um, I've still got a minute or two. I'm not going to take it all up. But what I will say is one of the flaws I think they've had is they've offered three options. One which is um, you're basically effectively major major boundary consolidation, aka mergers, another being moving, stripping councils of a lot of the current services to form these sort of regional bodies, and the third one is a bit of, bit of both. Um, what they haven't looked at is the contract city model, uh, which uh, is a really, uh, a really effective way to give both small councils and large councils uh, the efficiency of scope uh, and scale and also the flexibility to deliver services in a fashion and frequency that, that is um, wanted by their community by involving the private sector. Um, and I, I think that, that model really deserves looking at because I think what you've seen in California is actually quite remarkable and that's about the only compliment I've got around governance in that state at the moment. So on that basis, I will now be quiet and look forward to the contribution of others. Thank you, Councillor Walker. Before we I call another for on the second of the motion, the Deputy Mayor, I, just for the benefit of those uh, in the gallery and watching from home, Councillor Walker did circulate to colleagues uh, his amendments to his contribution <coughs> as, um, as reflected uh, in this submission to the local government board. I appreciate it is um, somewhat irregular to have occurred what, a, what, what occurred a moment ago, only in that it's not in written form, etc. Um, I did discuss this with the CEO before tonight. The CEO has those amendments. They are attributed to Councillor Walker as a councillor uh, of this council. So. Um, I would just uh, ask for, council, for the support of councillors for, for those uh, suggested amendments to be adopted because they are um, many of them minor, but they do appropriately reflect uh, what, uh, as I understand it, Councillor Walker was um, seeking to, uh, to convey. So now to the second of the moment. Do you have, sorry, do you have a question, Councillor yeah, Jones? I was just going to, uh, sorry to interrupt the Deputy Mayor, but just on that, I thought we in the motion that we were going to refer to our colleagues having another, having a viewpoint in relation to that as part of their submissions to the local government review. I just can't understand why at the 11th hour we are now accepting a, a colleague's contribution when in fact we were going to take it as being that there were a difference of opinion in relation to this, and they have gone forward to the local government review. Sure. Thank you, Councillor James. We should... Councillor James, you you were uh, um, a recipient of it. You may not have a chance to read it, sure, but uh, Councillor Walker emailed uh, all colleagues today. Uh, as we discussed on Friday, our agenda brief, uh, the covering letter from the CEO will make that quite clear. As we all know, the uh, deadline for making submissions, albeit we've had an extension, but as individual councillors, <coughs> That, uh, that's not afforded to us. You'll note, however, that part B of the motion, um, that we do reserve the right to make further representation on reform options. So that's what I understood that would cover off that concern appropriately for you, Councillor James? Well, again, with, with respect, Mr Mayor, I assume that we are going to include Alderman Walker's, uh, Councillor Walker's uh, amendments 
as part of the motion that's going forward under the uh, recommendations before us. That, that's right. Yes. Well, I can't agree. Well, unfortunately, I just. But, but they're not. Just to be clear, they're not attributed to anyone else except the individual councillor, and they're points of clarification. Uh, now, it's unfortunate that um, you know, agendas were printed uh, on Wednesday, um, and some of us might not might not get to them immediately. Uh, this is the first opportunity to cover off on that. Every elected member was afforded the opportunity to provide comments, as you yeah, know. Absolutely. Uh, Councillor Walker and one or two other colleagues availed themselves of that opportunity. Councillor Walker, as I understand it, is just keen to clarify the points that he was wishing to make. And I'm informed by the CEO that that really is uh, a couple of um, um, words here and there just to, if you like, for want of a better term, clean up uh, the contribution um, attributed to Councillor Walker. It's, it's not a view of council, it's a view of an individual council law. So I appreciate this is not, this is inelegant, this is not particularly, you know, yeah, the way we'd ordinarily do things, yeah. but I would just ask for some um, latitude on this occasion, because council did go to the trouble of, um, yeah, putting forward his individual position, and I thank him for all that. Deputy Mayor. Um, thank you, um, Mr Mayor. I'm very pleased to be able to second the motion. Naturally, this is uh, a very important issue for the entire state. Um, the, I congratulate also um, our officers in the diligent work that they've undertaken to put together a very comprehensive reply to the issues paper that was circulated uh, by the local government review process. Uh, for those of us, uh, I'm one of those people who uh, did make a personal submission directly to the review and um, Councillor Darker and I uh, attended this surreal session. Uh, the only thing I'd say about um, the timing would be that I, I would have liked to have seen a longer period between the conclusion of the workshops and the deadline for submissions for people that were attending the workshops. Would have been like to see that just be a little bit longer, given all the sorts of things that were going on, particularly in the south at the time. So, uh, but nevertheless, uh, did manage to get uh, my my own individual contribution <coughs> in, and also um, I um, recognise some of my own comments. Uh, in the contribution that the council is proposing to put uh, forward. These issues are going to resonate across this state for a very long time. So it's really important that we get it right. Um, naturally, there's going to be a very heavy debate moving forward around Tasmania about what the future of local government looks like. And it does appear to me that we have a government that's very... Um, uh, very keen on trying to get a result of some form at the end of it rather than a, a continuing talk fest, which I completely understand that position. Uh, so that being said, um, I'm uh, appreciative of the opportunity to have made a submission and I support the motion. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Other contributions? Councillor Mulder, thank you. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, this is one of those things where... Um, we could spend 300 years trying to get a document together that contained all our views, but it's a submission from us council. So I, I'm really pleased to see that the original proposal um, was to accept, but is now to note. And, and therefore you can make all your contributions. I've just, I, I, I was bemused by the fact that um, we only needed seven consultation sessions, but we still need 29 councils. <laughs> um, what I, I, I don't I, I accept a lot of the arguments about those sorts of things, but one of the things that I put in my submission, not through this formal, not through this process, but that I've long argued for, we may need local community advisory groups, but do we need 29 departmental ma general managers? Do we need 29 IT systems? Do we need 29 HR systems that are perpetually engaging with each other, trying to headhunt employees from our neighbours? This is the structure. In any corporate reform, the basic mantra is always to centralise administration 
but decentralise operations. And I think that is one of the key things that we are missing in this process. The capacity to centralise those back office functions and then allow individual the local area committees to relate to their communities and to and to develop ways forward. It just to me and I often think about this, it's like having a um, a a, um, an IT director for every police station, a commissioner in every police station, a you know an, an entire executive team in every police station, in every hospital, in every school. It just doesn't make sense in a place the size of Tasmania <coughs> to be having these duplications of executive functions and executive teams across all these little local areas. So you can have your local representation but do you need it? However, um, that is a, a view that, um, you know, that I've put forward. I don't expect to sit here around and, um, and to have a debate to the end, to, to, to the cows come home, to have everyone agree with me, as I certainly don't agree with some of the things the officers have said. But I think it's important that we put as a collective body some ideas forward, that we note the different views, and that's about all we're doing. Because in the end, um, we will do what we do. And one of the things that I, that I strike about this is our comments, um, this whole focus has been really um, on, on, on local government, suggesting we reform ourselves. Um, I think that's always fraught. Sometimes someone outside has to come in, rattle the can, get rid of the vested interests and sort out an efficient way of delivering the services of which we should justifiably be proud. Anyone else wish to make a contribution? Councillor James. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. And, and it's interesting to have that uh, recommendation on the board because it does um, uh, sign off on some of the matters that I did have some concerns about. And, and notwithstanding if all of uh, Councillor Walker's <laughs> comments are encapsulated within the re officer's recommendations on some of these items, if that's the case, I'm a little bit wary of that because we had the opportunity to put in our own submissions and we've also had this um, uh, recommendation or the original uh, recommendation adopted to have the word note and also allow other, other members of this place to be able to put forward their submissions. It's interesting on page 12 that um, mm. refer complex planning development applications to in independent uh, assessment panels appointed by the Tasmanian government. And what I find interesting here is that uh, the officers have made a very good point. And what they've said in part is that um, these issues have nothing to do with large councils' ability to deal with complex applications. And what I think they're saying here, and I agree with them, is that there is a, a move for larger councils. You know. The system that we have at the moment is just irrelevant as far as I'm concerned with 29 councils. And I took the opportunity the other night to go on Phil Clark's program <laughs> at 1am in the morning uh, on Nightline and uh, discuss uh, Tasmania's point of view. And I made the comment about, we have, and he actually made it, Phil Clark said, you must be over-governed to Billio down there. I don't think he used the word Billio, but he used that word. And he, he rattled off, you know, the number of House of Assembly, the number of legislative councils, the number of uh, federal and, and, and uh, 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 House of Representatives colleagues. And he said, you're over-governed. I said, well, yes, that's right, Phil. But anyway, the simple fact of the matter is that this is a good discussion paper. And at the end of the day, before I see my time out, I started here when there were 46 councils. Now we're to 29. And I've bandied with uh, uh, Leon Compton a couple of years ago, and I said, look, 13 is a good number, Leon, but we've got to do it slowly, gradually. We just can't say we'll have it 13 or three of the councils. So look, this is a good paper. It gives us the leeway to obviously um, say we are not 100% committed to this particular approach, Mr Mayor. But at the same time, it gives food for thought. And at the end of the day, if we end up, as I think it will happen, we'll have boundary adjustments 
And these little councils like Southern Midlands, and I've mentioned this before because I'm a ratepayer there, they have difficulty, and I believe, in maintaining their roads, their gravel roads, their bridges and so on and so forth. And there needs to be some adjustment to the boundaries to pick up a little bit of the commercial or industrial base to sort of give them a little bit more revenue and so on. So I'm in support of this. I think it's great. Let's send it forward. And those of us who have put in submissions, great. You know, this is the time we do it. And I believe, Mr General Manager, sorry, Mr CEO, that there will be another opportunity to... Um... Please direct your questions through the Chair. Oh, yes, Jones. certainly. Uh, through you, Mr Mayor, to the uh, CEO, there will be another opportunity to put forward further submissions at some stage. Is that right? Or is that uh, still to be determined? Is that right? Um, thank you for the question. Um, through you, Mayor. Um, yes, uh, my understanding is that uh, there'll be some recommendations um, out of the review board. Um, and that'll obviously be um, go through a process, uh, most likely with um, state government involvement at that point in time. Have you concluded, Councillor Jones? Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Any other colleagues wish to make a contribution? Being none, a right of reply, Councillor Walker. Thank everybody for their, their contributions, and I think through that it was clarified that uh, what I was doing was just uh, refining the feedback uh, that was mine and that is listed in the feedback session. And I do, I, I do give the, the leadership team um, some credit for the way they handled this because um, there's, there's no the, the lowest common denominator would be lucky to get a sentence of, 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 of agreement around an issue this big. Um, and this way we've been able, if you like, to put a whole lot of serves on the, uh, on the ideas buffet. Some of them quite, quite different, and that's, that I think is a good thing. I would just round up, again, thanking my colleagues that have contrib contributed. I look forward to reading your submissions when they're all put up online. Um, see whether some of them persuade me. Uh, and, but finally, the other point I'd make is that many of us have seen these sort of processes come and go in the past. Uh, I think this one is serious. I think, I think they're being real and uh, I think there may be a whole lot in the sector that uh, might just be taking it for granted. Uh, it is a sector in, in, in parts that um, is par excellence when it comes to masterly in action and intransigence, but I don't think those options are going to be as available as they used to be. Seek people's support. Thank you, Councillor Walker. I'll put the, most, the, the amended recommendation moved by Councillor Walker, seconded by the Deputy Mayor. All those in favour? That's unanimous. Thank you, colleagues. Moving now on to um, item nine. There are no motions on notice. Moving on to item 10, Councillor Question Time. There are no questions on notice. 10.2, there are no answers to questions on notice. Moving to 10.3, answers to questions without notice of previous council meeting. Item 10.4, questions without notice. Uh, what I will do this meeting is start with the Deputy Mayor and uh, if there are any questions without notice. Thank you, Councillor uh, Mulder. Thank you, Mr Mayor, and none for me. Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Hunter. None for me, thank you. Councillor Hume. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just want to uh, turn Council's attention to a news that featured on both um, ABC News Tasmania, so the TV news, and also the uh, ABC Radio's uh, PM program. Um, and I believe this was on uh, Wednesday. Um, about covenants on uh, subdivisions in Tasmania that disallow public housing and also disallow leasing houses to tenants who are receiving government payments. Um, a lot of people like me who would have heard that story would have been surprised uh, that this sort of practice is legal. Um, and what I found particularly disappointing was that of the three suburbs they uh, featured in that story, two of them were in the city of Clarence, uh, Mornington and Glebe Hill. My question is, is there anything Council can do about this? Thank you, Councillor Hume. Uh, Chief Executive Officer? Um, thank you, Mayor, and thank you for the question, Councillor Hume. Um, if I can be granted some leeway, um, I'll say that when I heard that story, I was as surprised as most people were. 
Um, we certainly weren't aware of those covenants or the manner in which they were used. And the reason for that is that when covenants are put on land titles, that's a matter that happens between the landowner um, and other parties that might be involved in that transaction and they're registered through the land titles office. Uh, so from a council point of view, we simply don't have any visibility of, of that, uh, that sort of activity. So it comes as a surprise. Um, in terms of the, uh, the discussion we've had internally, um, really the issue now becomes what, what is legal and what is not in respect to a covenant on a title. Um, and in the context of the use of this type of covenant, uh, having spoken with uh, Commissioner Sarah Bolt from the uh, Anti-Discrimination Commission, Equal Opportunity Tasmania as it's now known, um, uh, it doesn't fall within the ambit of the anti-discrimination legislation as well. So really the issue here, I think, um, is about legislative change uh, and discussing what is fair and reasonable in the context of, um, of the use of, of caveats and covenants on, on titles. Does that answer your question, Councillor? Might be a bit more than you asked for. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Chief Executive there's Officer. Nothing, there's nothing Councillor Hume, if there's a second question, if you'd like to stand, please. Okay, well, well, please stand if you want to do that. So, so it, it, in summary, there's, there's really nothing we can do about it? Uh, not without uh, legislative change is the advice I have at this point in time. Thank you, CEO. Thank you, Councillor Hume. Councillor Jones. Two questions. Uh, firstly, um, has Council been advised of the uh, Three Druthy Point Road Rokeby decision? Thank you, Councillor James. Um, so, yeah, Mr. Mr. Lovell, or I'm not sure what that relates to, Councillor James. Uh, it was in relation to some land adjacent. Well, uh, on Truthy Point Road, they wanted to have a um, machinery. Uh, what do we call it? Base plus stockpile oh, of the material. I the it, um, as I understand it, it went to mediation and I think it may have gone to appeal and I've been advised by a local that a decision has been made and council will be advised. Could we take that on notice, yeah. Councillor James? Thank you. And your second question, please. Yeah. Um, in relation to Regal Court, the, uh, uh, the situation with the golf course, would Mr Lovell be able to advise us of the current situation in relation to this matter? Thank you, Councillor James. Mr Lovell. Uh, through Mr Mayor, it's still a matter that's been deferred to a date to be fixed. Uh, that's out of our hands. When we know when it will resume, we'll be able to inform the Council. Thank you, Mr Lovell. Councillor Walker. Thank you. Councillor Goyne. Councillor Darko. Councillor Warren. Just one quick question. Um, through you, Mr Mayor, I'm wondering whether Mr Graham can um, clarify who is responsible for the footpaths along East Derwent Highway because I know East Derwent Highway itself is a state road, but um, is Council responsible for the footpaths because I've been advised of some issues? Thank you, Councillor Warren. Uh, Mr Graham. I'll seek clarification from Council's officers on that. I do believe we are responsible for that under the Roads and Jetties Act, but I'll seek clarification and advise um, councillors. Thank you. Councillor Warren, a second question? Councillor Chong. Councillor Kennedy. No, thank you, Mr All right. Well, um, that uh, answers our questions. Or, um, we now um, move to uh, our closed meeting. Uh, call for a motion to move into closed meeting. Thank you, Councillor Chong. Second, Councillor Hume. I'll put that motion. All those in favour? Thank you. That's unanimous. So thank you to those members of the public who have attended uh, in person this evening, as well as those joining us via the live stream. Um, please end the live stream now.